Good afternoon. My name is Craig Labovitz. I'm a CTO of Nokia Deepfield. Now, uh, I went to the first 50 nanogs, uh, sort of all of them consecutively, then took a break. A uh, lot of new faces. Uh, haven't been to uh, a nanog in the last uh, five or seven years. But uh, thank you for having me back. So about 10 years ago, I was up here. Well, not literally here, but I was at another nanog. And I gave a talk about what internet traffic looked like. In addition to my role at, at Nokia, I'm also a guy who likes to write a paper about every 10 years, for last you know, 30 years, about how the internet is evolving, how it's changing. So this is the third or fourth installment. So when we are measuring the internet, and a lot of the talk today is really about data from providers around the world, we're collecting SNMP, BGP, more recently gRPC, uh, more recently DNS recursive uh, responses from very large carriers across the US and Europe. I will say that this is very much a preliminary talk. Uh, ten years ago, it took us six months or so of processing and normalizing the data. Anyone who does analytics knows that data is noisy, requires an awful lot of cleaning to make sure you're not dealing with artifacts. So while I'm not going to stand by all the exact numbers today, directionally, the observations on the upcoming slides are indeed accurate. We're also working through with providers both in the U.S. and North America, as well as in Europe, on what data we can use and working through the agreement and permissions. We do have a pretty big view into US traffic. Give or take, number of eyeballs, about 75% uh, US eyeballs we're somehow engaged with, uh, working on QOE and traffic engineering. So again, this talk is pretty similar to at least some of the observations back in 2009, uh, but the data again needs to be cleaned. So I'll show a number of data points as I go through the observations. One of the observations, of course, is not particularly, particularly relevatory. The internet is getting bigger, and it's getting bigger rather quickly by traffic volume. Depending what you count, 40 to 50 percent uh, sort of annualized year over year. Uh, and this is across the board, ac across the world, though, of course, there are regional and provider variants. The other thing that's happening, as the internet traffic volume grows, the number of sources, the number of unique ASN, the number of BGB prefixes, the number of hosting and cloud providers is shrinking almost as rapidly. And I'll show some data on that as well. One of the main things, of course, that is happening is that the internet has completed the migration, give or take, to CDN. And I'll go through the rest of the bullet points coming up. All of this is important, of course, because the changing internet traffic flows, demands, are all having a significant impact on how we think about engineering, the network, doing QOE, and, of course, doing things like security and DDoS. So to jump into the data, first, you know, asking the question, how big is the internet, is somewhat of a fool's game now. Back 10 years ago, we looked primarily at interdomain traffic, that is, traffic across BGB peering links. Today, of course, huge volumes of traffic are not interdomain. They are coming from on-net CDN or direct peering or vi uh, provider video on demand. You know, what do you count when you count internet, internet traffic? We're seeing cable providers move qualms to internet and Basically, all U.S. providers are in the midst or have an immediate plan to move linear video to IP. So, you know, what you count becomes sort of an interesting question. But give or take, when I was last up in front of Nanog, we guessed the Internet was about, you know, 40 terabits per second, sort of at peak. Today, we're north of 800. Cisco may disagree with us by, you know, a couple hundred terabits, but generally, you know, I think the trend is there. And there's more details, by the way, on how we calculate this. If anyone really wants to wade through a paper from 10 years ago, there's uh, some excruciating level of detail on the math and the statistics. And, you know, I was just kind of curious to look at providers we looked at in 1997, excuse me, in 2009, and to see what their traffic pattern looked like in 2000 
in 19. The first observation was out of the 150 we tried to compare, it's really hard to compare. The number of companies that hadn't merged, been acquired, radically changed their business model between 2009 or otherwise consolidated was relatively small. But again, if you look at some of the providers, we're seeing you know, a range of different growth. So the biggest growth being with, again, the content providers and the consumer. But this is one of my, there's really two slides in this deck that I think are really interesting. This is one of them. When I started my career, CDN were a nice to have in the network. People deployed Akamai caches to offload their expensive transit. Maybe you could offload 10, 20% of your traffic. Through the years, the volume of traffic migrating from enterprise hosted to CDN has increased year by year. By the time you get to 2018, as we look at data across US providers, on average, CDN has grown to now north of 90% of traffic is broadly defined coming or going from CDN. And by the way, in this definition of, of CDN, we include Netflix and we include uh, dedicated uh, vendor CDN in addition to sort of the, the public Akamai's Fastly's of the world. So by the time you get to 2019, CDN is not an adjunct to the network. This pretty much is the network. And we've seen traffic engineering shift from worrying about peers and ASN and AS paths to really being a question of how do you interrelate with the CDN because it is such a large portion of the network traffic, largely driven by video. The other thing that's happened in this time frame is I'm looking at my, my colleague from the NSFnet days down here. When we used to do the NSFnet, we do traffic engineering once a month. We had really nice, like old telephony, uh, you know, sort of traffic growth. And once a month meetings were fine. By the time we get to 2019, not only is most of the traffic CDN, but it's adaptive bitrate, meaning the traffic will swing and grow and try to use uh, all the capacity of the link. Which, of course, makes things like looking at SNMP octets and other standard management tools a little hard to understand if you have a capacity issue. Because if you peer with Google, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll use that link, and as they rightly should. So really significant issues for how we look at doing traffic engineering. I should also note the definition of CDN is pretty blurry. You know, is S3 a CDN? Do you count all the providers that are doing edge compute? But if you look at actually the breakdown by traffic volume, certainly at peak, uh, and we look at P95, we're seeing folks like o Open Connect and YouTube really now, you know, third, uh, excuse me, vendor specific, application specific CDN uh, really being some of the largest portions. You know, 10 years ago, primarily it was all Akamai. We're now seeing uh, the Akamai traffic now much more distributed over folks like Level 3 CDN, Fastly, and other newer entrants in the market. So far more diverse CDN market than there was back in even 2009. And I should mention too, you know, when you look at this, this is looking at P95 traffic volume across a range of US providers. You know, not all traffic has the same monetary value. It's often hard to infer business value just looking at the traffic volumes. But this is a, a quick breakdown. This is my second favorite slide in the deck, or the one I find most interesting. For years, we've been watching the growth of the BGP prefixes. It was 30,000, then 100,000, 200,000. You know, we're now north, give or take, of what you're counting. 800,000 in the default free tables. That's huge. I never thought it would get this big. I never thought you all would be so good at disaggregating. Um, I'm only happy you now have V6 to work with. I can't wait to see uh, what happens. So huge BGP table. You know, the overall traffic volume has grown, the BGP table has grown, 
But if you actually look across 35 or 40 providers, look at the prefix, look at the traffic for BGP route, you'll find that for those 800,000, the vast, vast majority are getting very tiny amounts of traffic. In fact, you know, many of your customers would never notice if you dropped the bottom 780,000. Uh, most of the traffic is going to 1,000 or even 500 BGB prefixes. Again, all trends we've seen for a while, 10 years ago, uh, we were really seeing the real beginning of consolidation. Traffic moving to CDN, traffic moving to EC2 and other cloud providers. Where we are now is kind of the end of that decade-long transformation of internet traffic and internet consolidation. And of course, there's some really interesting, I think, things come out of this observation. You know, if you're worried about DDoS, if you are worried about traffic engineering, the focus is probably not the 750,000. It's probably this 1,000. If you're worried about floods of traffic and DDoS coming from all over the internet and aren't sure what to block, well, you don't need 800,000 ACL entries. You can do a lot more with FlowSpec, NetConf, with a focus on, you know, a thousand of them. So really interesting implications for how we think about security and how we think about traffic engineering. And as I said, you know, it's been a pretty interesting consolidation. You know, back when I started my career, we, everyone had their own website. You know, there were thousands of different video applications. I watched Flash video. But over time, we've seen incredible pace of consolidation for the applications. Now, the applications vary. If you look in Asia, there's basically 10 that dominate. All of them are slightly different. I don't think there's any overlap. And there's 10 that are basically get you to 70%, 80% of traffic in the US with, of course, Netflix during prime time being the peak, followed by, by YouTube streaming Amazon. But again, really tremendous consolidation in the market for what the average consumer goes to, what the average consumer views on any given day. And of course, the, the Chinese market looks quite different. One of the things I thought would take much longer to happen is TLS. You know, back when I gave my last Minog talk 10 years ago, you know, this was just a fraction of a percent of internet traffic, including, by the way, Quick, SSL, you know, other, other sorts of end-to-end uh, -end, uh, encryption of HTTPS and so on. But really, post-Snowden, uh, and as we get to 2018, for the first time, we've seen TLS actually not be a fraction of percent, but at least broadly measured across US providers, it is now the, finally the majority of traffic. And we're seeing that trend slowly continue. Though it is interesting watching Netflix and other video providers who are clearly experimenting, uh, sort of evaluating since there is, you know, there is non-zero cost associated with this migration to TLS. But uh, again, it's pretty interesting to see for the first time, at least as we measure it, 2018 is the year TLS became the majority. This also has some interesting implications for the way providers do measurement. Particularly in mobile networks, providers have typically relied on DPI to do both policing, uh, congestion control, as well as analytics. When the majority of your traffic is now TLS, that, of course, makes some of these payload inspection techniques much more challenging in 2019. Now, I was really fascinated this morning watching some of the discussion around V6. And I should add, by the way, about seven years ago, or maybe 10 years, 12 years ago, I wrote a blog lamenting the failure of V6. You know, back when I wrote this, probably in 2007, we had been chasing V6 for more than a decade, and it was still like 2% or 1% of traffic. 
And this was, again, pre-air and exhaustion, pre-ripe exhaustion. But back in 2007, the only thing to attract you to V6 was maybe seeing a dancing turtle or, yeah, see, I see some people remember. Uh, but th there wasn't a lot of drivers. So it really has been, uh, I think, uh, I was wrong. It took IPv4 exhaustion, and I forget what the number was this morning, you know, N dollars per IP, uh, 50. And by the way, we used to control 35 slash 8, so Bill and I are, are lamenting that we, uh, did, that, that would have been a lot. Uh, <laughs> now, now I know. But, uh, you know, we were lamenting that there was, uh, you know, very little IPv6. Uh, it really took the exhaustion in for IPv4 to be, mon IPv6 to be monetized. So, you know, if you actually look at Google numbers and others, we're seeing somewhere around 30% of I IP requests to Google being uh, v6 traffic. Uh, and indeed, over the last year and a half, two years, we've seen, you know, v6 traffic, again, across U.S. providers grow from a relatively small percentage to really 15 to 20 percent of traffic is now IPv6, certainly interdomain. The one thing I find interesting, though, is it stopped. We saw a nice ramp up for v6, and then really over the last year, as a percentage of v4, it stopped gaining. And I wasn't really sure why that was. I think this talk this morning provided some possible insight. But at least as a percentage growth, we've seen mostly flat on V6. And again, you know, if you look at where the V6 is coming from, like everything else in the internet, it's a relatively small number of providers are generating the majority of V6, led really by YouTube, uh, Netflix, you know, Apple, iTunes, Facebook, and others. And it's clear that there continues, uh, continues to be some experimentation, both with TLS and providers moving content to v6. That I think certainly warrants further study uh, and discussion. Now, so far I've been focused on talking about traffic. We also have large volumes of recursive DNS, probably one of the largest collections, uh, where as part of our monitoring, uh, in c conjunction with providers in the U.S. and around the world, we collect recursive DNS responses. Actually, using another talk, uh, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago again, five years ago, about DNS flow. So I was kind of curious, not just to look at traffic volume, but what happens if I spend a day and look at a couple billion DNS responses? How many IPs is that? You know, how big is the internet? How many, if you query, you, have, you know, a, uh, N, you know, 70 million users, billion DNS requests, how many different IPs do you get? Well, it turns out you get about 3 million. Uh, and then you really kind of hit a very long tail. So we like to talk about how big the internet is, how many millions of IPs or billions with IPv6. But at least from DNS perspective, you're about three million for, you know, uh, the long tail. I should say the actual domains, which is in red, continues to grow. But that's primarily because backup providers and a whole host of people encode things in the FQDN as they query. So you'll see, and there's also, by the way, things like subdomain, randomized subdomain, and you'll see like DDoS and lots of other stuff. As bad as they thought BGP was, DNS is even more noisy and, uh, you know, interesting as you look at the data. So as I said, I, I think uh, as we reflect on what's happening, we are seeing some challenges as we look at traffic engineering, quality of experience. Certainly we're seeing things like California, uh, GDRP, and others impact what types of data providers can get from the network. We're seeing encryption have a similar effect. Uh, I spent, by the way, the previous 15 years or whatever doing DDoS. So it's also in the next section I'll talk a little bit about how we see the DDoS market changing. And it's both, I think, good news and bad news. So, you know, first the bad news. 
DDoS attacks are growing. For a while, by the way, DDoS kind of flattened out. When you get to about 2011, everyone who's going to buy Arbor had bought Arbor. You kind of had a sort of flattening of sort of the, if you do a Google search for news articles, you know, there's kind of a uh, status quo had been arranged. Starting sometime after 2011, the status quo began to be upset. And we really had a couple things driving that. Number one was Gigi to the home. You know, if you have infected subscribers and they're 10 meg, you know, what are they going to do? When you have uh, 10, 100 gig, you know, one gig connected subscribers, it quickly becomes a different story. We've also seen, of course, the rapid growth. If you look at MAC addresses or leases, uh, DHCP leases in the home, we've gone from one or two, uh, you know, about five, six years ago, to now, you know, folks are quoting averages of 20 or 30. So huge explosion of IoT. When we did our first DDoS company, uh, now uh, 15 years ago, 18 years ago, most of the attacks were either reflector or they were spoofed. People sending just replay of sin, you know, sin attacks and others just as fast as they could. And spoofing was pretty easy. You could use a small number of machines, hide your source, spoof large volumes of synthetic replay traffic. By the time we get to 2019, BCP38, URPF, very little of the attack traffic we're seeing, or a small, much smaller fraction, maybe 5%, under 10%, is spoofed. And the vast majority is real stack, you know, things sending IoT devices and others, or reflectors sending the traffic. Though, while the DDoS attacks have grown, I think one of the interesting things is to see, when we look at reflectors, when we look at, you know, open NTP monolist, how many devices is that? So one of the other data sources we've been doing is we've been crawling the internet. Uh, for every attack we see, we're crawling every IP involved in the attack, and we're tracking how many web cameras, how many DNS resolvers, and so on. And it turns out, while the internet is big, it's not that big. In fact, you know, it is pretty straightforward to enumerate all of the stratum 1, NTP, stratum 2, all of the public DNS. It's pretty easy to enumerate all of the open DNS resolvers involved in attack. On average, we're seeing between you know, 8 and 10,000 resolvers, all of which handily fit into a nice flow spec or TCAM. Uh, where you can block the attack if you have that list. So while the attacks are growing, it's become a lot more straightforward as the internet has consolidated to understand what you need to whitelist and what you can block. It's also been, I think, very powerful as NetConf, Yang, gRPC, the silicon, both merchant silicon, uh, you know, Nokia has our own silicon, all sort of getting better. When we started my last DDoS company, you know, you, you were, it was crazy to think about installing ACLs on your router of the day. Uh, it was both you know, capacity, it was management, it was stability. Uh, today, FlowSpec and others have gone from being something only a few providers have done to, as I, as I have these conversations, fairly widely deployed. And you know, this is just an example. It's pretty amazing when you look at some of these attacks. This is a PlayStation uh, consumer under attack. These are all real IPs uh, coming from a variety of the titles wrong. This should actually be NTP. But this is an NTP monolist uh, from a range of sources, all attacking a, a PlayStation user. One of the nice things, by the way, is back when we started a DDoS company now 15 years ago, gamers attacking gamers were the biggest source of DDoS. Uh, at least one thing still holds true today. Uh, with that, I think I've left just about five minutes for questions. And it's quiet. Someone must have a question. Just to make me feel better, doesn't someone have a question? Just to make you feel better. Uh, Ahmed from CenturyLink. So uh, uh, you talked about TLS. So. Uh, uh, how does your DDoS fit uh, with TLS since it's, uh, you know, everything is hidden? Go back to your slide number 15. Uh, you know, a lot of those attacks you won't be able to see with TLS. 
Yeah, so in fact, I was using TLS as, as an example where, you know, payload inspection isn't helpful. From a DDoS perspective, TLS really doesn't play a significant role. You know, both other companies and, and you know, Nokia, uh, the, you know, the, um, the anti-DDoS technology will happily work by understanding, um, you know, the source IPs and the distribution. Now, as I said, uh, I think the payload mattered a lot more 10 years ago when the primary mitigation for DDoS was looking into the payload to find the invariant, the things that weren't spoofed. Typically, random numbers are hard, or at least they're expensive for computers, way more expensive than just replaying the same packet. So 10 years ago, for the technology for when there was a lot of spoofing, it was trying to find what someone forgot to randomize within their replay traffic and picking that out. With spoofing, no longer the majority, and now it's a pretty small minority of the DDoS we see, uh, the payload inspection is, is far less relevant. Anything else? One more. Hi, uh, Tony Tauber from Comcast. I, good talk, and there's a lot of things I'm thinking about, and I'll probably think of a better question to ask later. Uh, but th if you could go back a few slides, there was one thing about source, uh, you know, spoofing sources. Did you, um, th one of them had, like, Google Global Content Cache or something in there. I was wondering, uh, wait, back. Oh, oh, too up, fast. Up one. Yeah, this. So, the, the, right, two different things. What are those two Google, like, how do those play into? Oh, yeah. So, I wasn't suggesting amplifier. GGC was, uh, I was just using GGC as sort of a, a relative benchmark for IPs out there if you go crawling. The Google Safe Browsing is we did integration with Google Safe Browsing. And I was curious, for everything that matches an FQDN, how many IPs is that in a given day? for a, a network. Uh, and again, it's resolving FQDN at any given time via the DNS to the actual IPs matched. And it's about 12, you know, 12, 13,000. Just providing sort of relative scale of the size of the internet, size of the threat. Oh, okay, so it's not saying they are the source of... Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, this is part, I actually yeah. cobbled together slides from like three different talks, so uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. But yeah, this is just relative magnitude. Uh, but that's roughly a number you get for what we're seeing used over a period of several weeks, open resolvers. Uh, I don't think GGC, though they might be causing traffic headaches for you, I don't think they're actually attacking you. Oh, no. Good. Okay. I think I'm just out of time. Maybe if there's one more. If not, uh, I think I'm all set. Thank you.